The Theosophical Society was established in Sweden in the late 1880s. The formal creation of the Swedish organization was prefigured by the publication of a number of translated theosophical works earlier in the 1880s. In 1887, for example, the Anglo-Indian theosophist Alfred Sinnett's influential esoteric Buddhism was translated into Swedish by Victor Pfeiffer, one of the individuals who would go on to become one of the founders of the Swedish Theosophical Society. Perhaps even more important is the fact that uh, the Swedish press took an increasing interest in the movement at the time. In the years prior to the founding of the Swedish society, a number of activities related to theosophy was covered in the Swedish daily newspapers. Theosophical literature was reviewed, lectures held about theosophy were publicized, and sometimes even abridged accounts of these lectures were printed. Once uh, the first official organization had been created, the movement expanded rapidly. Several local lodges were founded uh, during the organization's first decades, and theosophy drew the attention of culturally and politically influential circles. Even though the major centers of the movement were located in the capital city of Stockholm and in Gothenburg, Sweden's second largest city, there was an active theosophical environment in parts of the countryside and in small towns as well. Theosophy in the other Nordic countries developed with a strong influence from Sweden. The history of Nordic theosophy and its organizational development can be briefly summarized as the story of how a movement heavily influenced by Swedish theosophy gradually developed a stronger regional and national presence and autonomy. During most of its first two decades, Nordic theosophy was largely organized from Sweden and membership figures from the mid-1890s showed that the movement in Sweden had more members than Norway, Finland and Denmark combined. The organizational structure centered around lodges, a term which theosophy likely picked up from Freemasonry, was doubtlessly an important factor in the initial success of the movement. Local groups served a social function, but were also tools for disseminating the message. Many lodges had small libraries that were open to the public, they held lectures, debates, and invited traveling members from other lodges and from the capital city, and sometimes even from outside of the country. In the sometimes dreary atmosphere of a 19th century Swedish small town, lectures about ancient civilizations, spirit beings, or a little known religion like Buddhism must have constituted a considerable source of entertainment and wonder. Swedish schools at the time did not teach anything about religions other than the history and the theology of the state church. There was no or very little available literature about Buddhism that would have been understandable to a non-specialist. All information would have come from the reports of missionaries or from travelers who, whose accounts of the visits to distant places were sometimes covered in the newspapers or in travel books. It is important to hold these circumstances in mind when considering the early Swedish exposure to an unfamiliar religious tradition like Buddhism. As they tended to do internationally, theosophists in Sweden were highly engaged in getting their message across through the medium of print. They published a large number of books and pamphlets during the movement's first two decades and, perhaps uh, even more significantly, they published a number of periodicals. These often uh, included accounts of the activities organized by the different lodges, questions from readers that were answered by the journal's editors, and advertisements for books and uh, theosophical lending libraries. The most common type of content, however, was essays covering a broad range of subject matter related to the theosophical worldview. Increasingly, journals like the early theosophical periodical Theosophisk Tidskrift, roughly translatable as the Theosophical Magazine, often included reports of uh, what was going on in the movement around the world, including the activities of many South Asian lodges. <clears throat> 
For example, in the very first number of Theosophisk Tidskift, readers of the journal learned about a meeting held in Bombay on the 7th of September 1890 at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, where the chairman, one Dr. Krishnaji, had answered questions from the public and debated the subject of what the notion of karma really was according to the teachings of Vedanta. This kind of exposure to non-Christian religious topics, I would argue, was more or less unique in Sweden at the time. It should not be forgotten that most of the adherents of theosophy in Sweden, as I am sure elsewhere, were rather everyday individuals, without any exceptional claims to fame, social status or specialist training. As is the case with any organization or social movement, the Theosophical Society would not have existed without the sacrifice of labor and time offered by persons like this. However, Theosophy in Sweden would not have become what it became without its ability to also attract a number of high-status members who were highly culturally influential in the society in which they lived. This is doubtlessly one explanation for the fact that the early movement, although never numerically large, exerted a significant cultural influence. Theosophy was, perhaps unsurprisingly, quite popular among artists and writers. It included members from the nobility, but it also drew members from socially engaged parts of the middle class, as well as from the emerging workers' movement that would create the Social Democratic Party, for a long period, Sweden's dominant political party, around the same period. In fact, parts of the Theosophical movement were highly engaged in different social issues. Perhaps the best example of this is the movement's involvement with educational reform, something that characterized the group known as the Universal Brotherhood, one of the splinter organizations that was a product of a split within the original society. The leadership of the Universal Brotherhood came to uh, especially emphasize Theosophy's social and societal engagement. Here, education was given a special position. The Universal Brotherhood did, however, largely preserve the Theosophical teachings connected to Blavatsky and others, and the aims and goals of their system of education are clearly to some extent formulated within a worldview characterized by these teachings. Beliefs in ancient wisdom, reincarnation and spiritual evolution, as well as um, the tendency to view human development as a struggle between a higher spiritual self and a lower animal self, tended to permeate the concrete socially conscious projects undertaken by the Universal Brotherhood. The movement's experiments in education was uh, somewhat successful in the United States, but less so in Sweden, where the regulations controlling education were stricter and the Theosophical movement, although influential, was smaller. Followers of the Universal Brotherhood did however manage to organize a summer school which operated outside the established system of schools. During the early 20th century, the Swedish state church still had extensive control over education. The Theosophical movement uh, were among the early voices for the creation of a system of education that would be religiously neutral. Rather than compulsory instructions in the state-sanctioned version of Lutheranism, they argue that uh, religious education should give information about all major religious traditions. The Theosophical movement was also involved in other social causes like temperance and, as we shall see later on, vegetarianism. Both of these subjects were portrayed as uh, of individual and societal importance, in part with arguments directly rooted in Theosophy's understanding of humanity and the world.